interesting that, that when I was walking through airports with Gary, uh, whether it was in the West or the East, he was being absolutely mobbed. So something is happening out there. <laughs> I think, I think the situation is very serious, but I do think the ice is beginning to crack, okay? Yeah. So what are we going to do about it? What are Gary and I in particular going to do about it? And I'll tell you what we're going to do about it. We're going to win the election! Yeah. <laughs> we can win! We can win! And the reason I say that is that we have winning arguments, and I do think the American people are very curious. They do feel kind of starved for information, so they will listen, and when they listen, this is what they're going to hear. Gary Johnson and Bill Weld are both two-term Republican governors of blue states who succeeded Democratic governors and who came in and succeeded in balancing the state's books and putting its fiscal house into order in a matter of months. Okay. That's, that's kind of what needs to be done in Washington, D.C. Both the other candidates have made it abundantly clear that they have no intention of going anywhere near putting the fiscal house of the government in order. They're not going to touch entitlements. They're going to increase spending here. They're going to increase spending there. Uh, it's just they're not serious about doing what has to be done. Gary and I have both done it. As Leslie said, we weren't ridden out of town on a rail for doing it. Uh, it's not impossible. All that's required is political will. Uh, we were reelected with wide margins. I got 71% of the vote in Massachusetts on my reelection. That's a big number. Mr. Trump has no, no government experience whatsoever. Uh, his experience consists of saying, believe me, believe me, even when what he's saying, <laughs> even when what he's saying, and uh, really more often than not, when what he's saying is palpably ridiculous. Uh, but, but so that's not experience of any kind. Uh, Mrs. Clinton does have a little bit in the State Department, but it, it's not experience of the type I'm talking about, which is truly executive experience demanding political will and, and reversing decades of neglect and uh, uh, bad, uh, bad practices. So I, I think the most either of them could say is I hope, I hope to do the same uh, as these two governors did. But hope is not a plan. We have a plan which is to do exactly what we've done before. So that's the first thing the voters are going to hear. I think it's persuasive. The second thing they're going to hear is that on the merits, we represent a mix of policy positions that is not represented by either of the other parties. Nobody would view the Democratic Party as being fiscally responsible these days. Every promise that's been made, uh, it's just uh, the taxes are going to go up, spending is going to go up, and it, nothing could be clearer than that. Uh, Mr. Trump, uh, similarly, uh, is the head of a party which uh, has tried to be as mean-spirited as possible. They had a mean-spirited platform before they got to Cleveland, and then they amended it to make it more mean-spirited. <laughs> From the beginning, you know, Mr. Trump has set out to uh, uh, pit group against group. And if I had to say one thing about the country, uh, that Gary and I, in general, are optimistic uh, about the country and America's prospects, and we think we're well-positioned as, as a country. The one thing that does trouble me is that Mr. Trump and others seem to have succeeded in setting people's teeth on edge and in pitting group against group. And they're, they're doing the opposite of what, for example, President Reagan did, which is to make people feel good about being an American. Mr. Trump seems to think that his job is to make people feel bad about being an American. That is no way for a presidential candidate to act. So, you know, the, the, uh, the voters are going to hear from us that we are uh, optimistic that we would go to Washington and appoint libertarians, of course, but also some Republicans and some Democrats who agree with us on the issues. 
And uh, that has a better chance of getting something done in Washington than a continuation of the poisonously partisan rancor that characterizes it right now with only the R's and the D's. So we get more work done in Washington, and I think that will be persuasive as well. You know, the polling shows that about 60% of the people in the United States share our combination of views, fiscally responsible, socially inclusive. That's a very big number. Uh, Gary likes to say we've got a six-lane highway going right up the middle uh, of the electorate and uh, talk about an addressable market. Uh, we, once our message is heard and people are focusing on us, whether we're inside the debate hall or outside the debate hall, easier if we're inside, not impossible if we're outside, uh, the point is focus and name recognition and listening, which is why I'm so happy, we're all happy that you all are here today. Uh, once that happens, uh, we think that people are not going to go to one extreme or the other, and they're not going to be brainwashed by the palaver coming out of Washington, D.C., and that we will win the election. And at the end of the day, the last reason that I have such confidence that we will win the election is that one of the most estimable, estimable men I've ever met uh, is my uh, ticket mate, and uh, it gives me honor, pleasure, and pride to introduce to you the next president of the United States, Gary Johnson. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks. Really? Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Look, I, I want to start off with, a, with an apology to all of you. This whole Aleppo gaffe. No, no, I, I really, really. All of us work so hard, we care so much about these issues, and I want you to know that I really, really care about these issues. I care about the fact that American men and service women are losing their lives, that they're getting injured, that they're getting, uh, that they're, that they're coming back with afflictions that we need to deal with perhaps for the rest of their lives. I care about the fact that there are innocent tens of thousands of people that are innocently being killed throughout the world because of our military policy. And it's not intentional on our part, but there is an opportunity to bring peace to the world and that all of us care about this so much. And here it is, I, I blow it on this whole, what is Aleppo? And I, I am sorry for that. And, and no, no, but no, listen, listen. But the, the issue, and then the issue, the issue is, and, and everybody wants to make fun, everybody wants to make fun of the gaffe, but the issue is, is that here we have at the epicenter of the Syrian crisis, we've got, we've got Assad on, on one side of Aleppo, we've got the Free Syrian uh, Army on the other side, someone that we are supporting. They're allied with the Islamists, uh, Islamists some, some that we're not so allied with. Um, the Free Syrian Army, we arm the Free Syrian Army and they lose their weapons so that the Islamists get the weapons. And then what's happening in Raqqa, uh, ISIS, we're aligned with the Kurds uh, against ISIS. But gee, the Kurds are sideways with our ally Turkey, who's not as much of an ally as they were because, because we invaded Iraq. This is, this is what we're so concerned about. This is what we're doing throughout the world. The unintended consequence of us supporting regime change that has made the world less safe, not more safe. And right now, on the eve of 9-11, something that profoundly affected all of our lives, Garrett Goodman is here with us. Garrett Goodwin is here with us, uh, an Army combat medic uh, who served or who was 
9-11 ground zero at the Pentagon and then came here to New York and worked tirelessly for 24 days um, starting on, on the 12th, representative of thousands of people like himself who did this. We all came together for New York. You were here. You saw it. Garrett, please, just wave your hand. Thank you for being here. Yes, yes. That's who we are as a people. That's who we are. And this is the craziest election ever. It is. And it's as crazy because even in spite of Aleppo, I think I'm going to be the next president of the United States. I do. I do. And and really, and beyond my beyond my wildest dreams, beyond my wildest expectations, Bill Weld is my running mate, and he is somebody he is somebody who passionately cares about this country and the direction that this country is going and made an incredible difference as governor of Massachusetts, being a role model for me throughout this whole process. Brainy Bill, and he's called me Honest Gary. These are the names we're going to try and adopt for ourselves. And, and adversity, all right? Adversity. We all make mistakes, right? We all make mistakes. Mistakes, mistakes is a part of everyday life. But it's how you deal with mistakes that ultimately determine success. So tell the truth. You don't have to remember anything. And the unforgivable in life is hypocrisy. Saying one thing. Saying one thing and doing another, Bill Weld and I are not hypocrites. Both of us believe in entrepreneurs. Both of us believe that all of us, all of us have the opportunity to be entrepreneurs. All of us have the opportunity to create our own jobs. Not, not to laugh. It's, Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. It's how you deal with it. It's how you deal with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think there is a conspiracy. I get all wound. I get I get all wound up on television and then all of a sudden the satellite feed miraculously goes away. I mean, it ha <laughs> But believing in entrepreneurship, really, all of us, all of us, if there's a, an advice I would have for everybody here in the room, uh, and my advice is worth exactly what you're paying for, which is nothing, but, <laughs> but, but my advice is, is that whatever you know, whatever it is you do, apply it entrepreneurially. There will never be a greater reward. Create your own job create jobs for others, and government does have a role in all of this. Government can make that easier, not harder. And right now, right now the government does work to make that just about as difficult as it possibly can be. I really think that the model of the future, which is incredibly exciting, is the sharing economy. It's Airbnb. It's the ability to... It's, it's Airbnb. It's Uber. I think it's Uber everything. It's, it's Uber electrician. It's Uber plumber. It's Uber doctor. It's eliminating the middleman, allowing for you as the provider of goods and services to directly give them to the end user. End user pays less. You make more. I just think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg uh, with regard to where this is going to go. And, 